All right, thank you everybody for joining our webinar on the role of commissioning and projects. Um, and the goal is getting the most of the value out of the process. Let me start by in introducing ourselves. Um, my, my name is David Bonifacic and I am the CEO of WB Engineering. And I'm proud to have with me uh, two extraordinary individuals. First is Abraham. He's our team leader and account manager for our commissioning team. Abraham has been with us a number of years, is a principal of the firm. He's also responsible for team development and making sure our clients are happy when we do commissioning projects. And second is Bennett. Bennett is our operation manager for all our commissioning projects for the firm. He is the hands-on and leads a team of individuals in the field. And he is really, Ben is really the one who is the most familiar with the commissioning processes and writing scripts and coordinating in the field. So. We have two very talented individuals straddling two sides of the commissioning practice. With that, I'd like to um, start off the three key ideas. Let me start with like what we want to accomplish with this webinar. First of all, we love questions. Uh, questions makes this webinar not boring, to be blunt. Uh, questions, uh, so please, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat and I will moderate them and get them answered as best as we can. At the end of the presentation, we will open up the mics for any, anyone to freely chime in with any questions or comments. We will be reviewing the process, uh, which many, the commissioning process, which many already know what it is, but the process, we're using the process as a framework to facilitate discussion and really get lessons learned from the field into this webinar so people can learn. And this third part I'd like to uh, bring uh, talk about is three key ideas that we'd like to emphasize. And the three are commissioning is a process, it's collaborative, and it's an investment. And the reason why we say it's a process, it's like it's like going to the gym. You can't cut corners. You really have to start from, you know, it's, it takes you longer and it takes you earlier and longer to get this done correctly. It's collaborative because um, it has to take many different keyholes, T stakeholders, project stakeholders, and get everyone's input in what they really need. So it's a, it's a really a collaborative uh, exercise. And this is where commissioning touches the design, the construction, the end user, the client, the facility managers, and really brings all their needs together into one process, which is called commissioning. And it's an investment. And uh, you sp many of these projects, we spend so much money on these projects why cut corners at the end and not make sure it's test it's like a car make sure that the car is test driven make sure we get what we need in the car so that's why it's considered an investment so why cut corners there next slide please well cool thank you dave for the intro and hello everyone um speaking of cars we wanted to kind of kick this off with a, a fun illustration that captures the key commissioning main ideas that Dave just mentioned, the process, uh, inclusion and investment. Um, you've probably seen different variations of this picture, but all the projects that we have worked with basically begin with a client need. These needs come with a certain amount of requirements, goals, and expectations. And what happens oftentimes is these requirements are not transferred over flawlessly to the design or, implement, or implementation team due to any number of reasons, misunderstandings, misinterpretations of the requirements. And there's slight deviation from the original requirements during design and it further escalates into construction. Um, at the end of the day, you may have a car, right? That can get you from point A to point B, but it's going to be a very different car than what was expected. It may be less efficient, maybe smaller, larger, not as comfortable, not as flexible, but it's too late to change that once the product is delivered, not without significant cost and schedule impacts. Um, most of the time, the biggest contributing factor to this is just a lack of communication amongst the stakeholders, from the client to the end user, to the design professionals, to the contractors, facility team, et cetera. The commissioning agent is the one that puts and ties this all together. They ensure that the the from early design through construction, through post occupancy, that the project stays on on the right track. The deliverable aligns with the original need that started the project, and that all of the stakeholders are engaged and reap the benefits of commissioning. 
it's estimated that 61% of projects do not get commissioned. And that's a scary statistic. That means that these projects are turned over without any confirmation that all of the client needs were met, uh, without any de demonstration that the systems are performing as intended. And we hope that these types of presentations help the industry collectively reduce this number. Um, we're going to chat a bit about benefits of commissioning <clears throat> before we get into the process. And there's no shortage of information out there, metrics, stats uh, 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 that highlight um, the benefits of commissioning. But we wanted to highlight a survey published by the Building Commissioning Association, <clears throat> BCXA. It's, it was funded by a grant from the Department of Energy. And they surveyed parties across all of the stakeholders and industries we work with um, who were actually directly involved with projects with commissioning. And we want to share some of those stats from the survey. And at, at the end of the day, we have a common goal. We all have all the stakeholders have a common goal to deliver the best outcome for our mutual client. Uh, so we try to group these in benefit, these benefits by stakeholders so they resonate a little bit more. Um, and these are our stakeholders we are typically involved with and have experience with. Um, starting off with end users, 79% of those polled agree that one key benefit to commissioning, one of the main benefits of commissioning is that they were able to occupy the space on time. And that is due to the upfront effort by the commissioning team during design and construction, ensuring that the entire team is communicating and are in alignment and there's no rework, redesign. Um, we've all been there where we faced uh, delays in a project prohibiting the end user from moving in. And these projects are painful. And it not only costs the client a significant amount of money, but everyone involved in the project is affected. 72% noted improved IAQ and direct quality as another major reason for commissioning. Um, commissioning ensures that your mechanical systems, including ventilation, filtration, sensors, et cetera, all are working properly, ensuring that the space is comfortable and safe for its occupants. There's also a ton of data out there that directly link increased employee productivity anywhere between four to 8% with improved indoor air quality. And that's a huge number. Um, I mean, it goes without saying that comfortable employees tend to feel better and tend to do better work. Um, because of the energy savings from commissioning is also a direct impact to your ESG score um, as an end user, which can set you apart from your peers. Um, a, a big component of ESG, the E is environmental, and, and a big component of that is carbon emissions and reducing energy consumption. For next slide is for, I think it's property or asset managers. Um, on average, there's a 13% energy savings when commissioning is performed. Considering that most of your energy consumption is due to your MEP systems, a 13% reduction is, is quite significant. Um, the average payback is approximately four years. That is a very attractive rate of return. It actually goes down to one, 1.1, 1 .1, anywhere between one to one and a half years for commissioning of existing systems or retro commissioning. So that's even more attractive. Um, by reducing your operating expenses, you are directly increasing your asset value, um, which is another benefit that you don't see on the screen. Um, Christian also helps you gain compliance with energy codes and local laws, um, like Local Law 97, uh, which we all know carry a stiff penalty. It uh, allows you to increase your energy star grade, which can make the building more profitable, oh, I'm sorry, marketable to potential tenants in the market. Um, for facility managers, uh, the biggest gripe that facility managers have once the systems are turned over are comfort complaints and nuisance calls. And it's no surprise that 95% of those polls said that commissioning helps significantly reduce the complaints by ensuring the systems are actually working as designed before they're turned over. Um, another big issue with facility team is inadequate clearances to properly uh, maintain equipment. And 87% of those surveyed agreed that commissioning played a key role in ensuring that adequate clearances and access. Um, and oftentimes during construction and design, design the construction team are under pressure to stay on schedule and sometimes equipment ends up with insufficient access. So commissioning ensures that this does not happen, um, but they do have to be onboarded early because this is a process, this is typically caught during design um, in coordination and collaboration with the design team. Um, so the, the effects of commission doesn't end once they leave the site. Commissioning ensures that the facility team is trained on the equipment so they can provide the critical maintenance that will be needed, which in turn improves the equipment life expectancy. Um, and many of those surveyed also read, you see by these uh, the stats. For project managers, um, because of the peer reviews, 
submittal reviews and the early engagement of the, the commissioning team, 90% of those surveyed attribute commissioning to keeping the project on schedule uh, by avoiding costly redesign or rework on a project. 74% agree that commissioning improves construction team coordination. The commissioning agent is the one that facilitates collaboration with all of the team members. Um, and at the end of the day, what really matters is our mutual client is happy and gets what they wanted, what they needed, and what they paid for. So these are just some of the stakeholders involved in the project. Um, uh, but the entire team involved has, as they say, some skin in the game. Um, and they can benefit from commissioning. And they can also be negatively impacted if, in one way or another, if commissioning is not performed. Abraham, if I may. Um, yeah. Why isn't it done more often? I mean, I think if you look at engineer specs, they list commissioning many times. Um, but why isn't commissioning done? Well, maybe it is done. Yeah. Uh, maybe... I mean, there there is a misunderstanding that I think by a lot of end users' clients uh, in this industry that commissioning is being taken care of by someone. It's being handled by someone on the team. I mean, I'm paying a lot of money to my design professionals to the contractors, uh, et cetera. But without a third party commissioning agent that will actually spell out what testing they would need to see and 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 basically you know, uh, showing the, the contractor how he needs to demonstrate that the system is, system is actually functionally te uh, running is, is not going to happen without a third party commissioning agent. Um, you'll not get a full functional performance test uh, where you go through the sequence of operations because uh, the commission agents, part of the commission agent services is to provide that checklist, that test script. Um, the word commissioning is used a lot. I think we hear them almost on every project. Towards the end, you know, it's punch list and commissioning or testing. Without a third party commissioning agent who's developing these scripts and then it will get into that in a second with the actual process, what they're really referring to is just a factory startup, which, you know, someone from the factory comes out there, they'll bump the AC unit or whatever chiller it is, and that's it. No one's looking at the full system, all the other components, the dampers, the valves, the sensors. No one's doing a, a, a performance test. And at the end of the day, like in that car example, you'll get a car that may get you to point A to point B. They might not even be had a cold complaints or, or, or issues in the space, but they could be serious issues going on with the equipment that is causing you to waste energy uh, and, and reducing the, the equipment's life expectancy. This is all happening a lot of times without you know the end user or facility team even knowing. So once this misunderstanding comes up or, or discussed, um, almost every time a commissioning agent is onboarded. And we're trying to get that onboarding sooner done sooner rather than later during design so you can reap all of the benefits. Um, okay, enough about Bennett for a second. So let's get into the commissioning process and I'll, I'm gonna hand it off to, to Bennett. Thanks, Abe. Um, yeah, so I wanna start talking about the commissioning process. Uh, it, thanks for providing a lot of those stats that kind of talk about the investment, the value of it, the collaboration. Um, I think the goal for this process is to under, this part of the presentation to understand how we get there um, and how we can kind of achieve those stats. Uh, we're gonna walk through the commissioning process uh, the three main phases of design, construction, and acceptance uh, and warranty phase, and what they do. We won't go through every single task that can be done in those phases, but I think we want to highlight a couple that can really provide a lot of value and sometimes are often overlooked. So these are things that we can kind of focus on um, and emphasize, and a lot of the listeners here today can can use on their projects in the future and make sure they're included in their, in their RFPs. Um, High level, talk about the design phase. Um, again, this is, I wanna emphasize how much of a process is, is and how we should really get involved as soon as the project's really even conceived and, and kind of get onboarded with the design team. Uh, but the part of the goal for this phase is to make sure that all the project is aligned with the client's goals and the operational needs uh, and that everyone has what they need. So this is the collaborative process, everyone aligning, everyone getting an opportunity to voice their needs and, and what they need for the project. The construction phase is obviously what most people recognize commissioning as. Uh, that's when you see us the most on site. That's when we're doing a lot of the functional testing, finding issues um, and, and providing a lot of solutions to the clients. Uh, and then finally in the acceptancy and warranty phase, 
that's the handover. That's that's a, a really vital process that can be very valuable. Uh, more than just providing a final report or final document, um, there can be a lot of a lot of handover uh, and, and documentation and training that, that we can get involved in. So, um, Bill um, uh, Bennett, uh, number one, design pre pre construction phase. Doesn't your engineer do that? That that's I've always. Where's the demark between engineer and design engineer and commissioning agent? Yeah, and, and this is a, a good point to kind of clarify. Um, th this is there are a lot of commissioning tasks that are during completed during the design phase. Um, even though we're not doing the specific designing, um, although oftentimes we, we will help out um, and provide comments, but there are a, a list of things that we can go through to, to help out. And it's it's pretty well documented from, from the ASHRAE standard 202 of, of all the things that we can do during the design phase. Uh, starting off, uh, the first I think the first task that we want to highlight is the owner's project requirements, uh, commonly referred to as an OPR. Uh, the OPR kind of forms, it's a document, it gives the owner the opportunity to kind of voice their opinions and needs and requirements for a project. And it, and it forms the basis for which all design, construction, and acceptance decisions are made. So specifically in an OPR, you'll see you'll see sections like the general project description, objectives, functional uses, occupancy requirements, budget criteria, and maybe performance criteria. Um, it's an opportunity for the owner to really like I said earlier, voice their kind of any unique things that they want to point out, whether it's, I want a BMS system in this specific room. I want access to Wi-Fi throughout this space. I want to be able to test water pressure throughout my building. Um, anything that is somewhat outside of the norm, it's a way to document and it kind of guides a lot of what the commissioning agent is supposed to do. The second task that we want to highlight is, is the design review during the design phase for the commissioning provider. Um, now this is slightly different than a, a, a peer review or something that's done during a DD or a CD phase from the design team. Um, it, it can be, it's more focused on collaboration and make sure everyone's aligned and making sure everyone, there's no ambiguity, questions can be answered and asked early, um, but the kind of the main focus is to identify locations uh, in design documents where concerns are identified, ask questions to gain clarity to provide a narrative regarding those questions, suggest recommendations, and then finally to tie everything back to the OPR. So we identified everything in the OPR and we carry it through the design. So the commissioning agent is, their goal is to make sure that project as a whole is meeting their needs, not just a specific mechanical component or electrical component, but everything is working together. Uh, I, I did see that um, there's a study by the BCA that the Building Commission Association said that about 25% of issues are identified during the design phase or can be identified during the design phase. Uh, why is that vital? Um, because it's all about catching problems early. So the earlier you can catch them, the, the cheaper it is to fix them. If you're finding issues after your building is constructed, walls are up, ceilings are up, it's harder to get to equipment. You have to rebook a crane. Um, anything that costs a lot of money, it's, it's vital to catch these things early so that there's more coordination, more effort can be spent fine tuning the system. Right. And then finally, the other task that we wanna highlight in the design phase is the commissioning plan, the CX plan. Uh, th this is, I view this as really like a digestible version of the commission specs. Everything that is in the commission specs is laid out in the commission plan, but the commission plan is all about alignment. So it could, uh, no, that's, that's um, the OPR, um, then it sounds similar to a design na narrative or a schematic design. Well, how is it different? Yeah, good question. I mean, so the design narrative that's mostly done by the design team. I'm, I'm sure they, they kind of bring in the owner and say, what are your initial requests and requirements? And they, they'll approve it. Oftentimes when, it, when an OPR is not used, they will kind of fill it out and say, meets all local design codes and criteria and just follow the design narrative. Um, that same uh, market research survey from that we mentioned earlier from the DOE mentioned that about 60 to 70 projects don't use an OPR or rarely use an OPR. 
So this is what I was highlighting, how it's, it's, a, it's a document that should be used, provides a lot of value, and it's an opportunity for a lot of people to gain, gain clarity in the process. So it's, it's big thing is where it comes from. The design narrative or, or an SD set comes from the design engineer. The owner's project requirements are created by the owner and it can be uh, created with assistance from the commissioning provider. And on the design review, I'm, I'm coming, I'm speaking on behalf of the engineers. Mm -hmm. um, we review designs. What, what, where are you coming from a different perspective? Where, where are you, when you're designing, doing completing design reviews, what are you looking for? Yeah, so we don't look at, are the size criteria correct? Are we violating any codes? It's, it's more, as I mentioned earlier, about collaboration. And because we have experience for what contractors out in the field will see and get tripped up on and have some confusion on or have some ambiguity. It's all about providing clarity and specifically between the disciplines, between electrical, mechanical, and plumbing, making sure everything's referencing the same thing. Um, but again, we're putting kind of the owner in our on, like, on our shoulder as we go through the design review. So we're coming at it from their perspective and, and carrying the owner's, the, really the spirit of the OPR through the design review. So th th that's where it's slightly different, um, more so than just, you know, <laughs> design can get very technical with making sure line weights are, are correct and um, you have clarity in sizing and intent um, in the basis of design. But like I said, it's, it's a little bit more high level about, and it's all about collaboration, make sure that we can catch stuff early. And it's, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to kind of review the, the design as relative to the sequence of operation, to the equipment selected, um, to make sure that they were all compatible. Sequence of operation is a, obviously a, a big deal when it comes to commissioning. And that's something that you know, we find, we pick up a lot in terms of discrepancies in the design. Okay, I have a question from, uh, from this, uh... The attendees. Um, sure. One is uh, I, IE, double, IECC 2021 requires construction documents to clearly indicate provisions for commissioning. Are engineers actually providing code compliant commissioning specifications? Question mark. How are or how should uh, commissioning specs be developed for projects? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So it, they should be developed by the commissioning provider. Um, oftentimes a, a design professional sh will have a kind of a standard commissioning spec. And I think that's really meant to be a catch all for if a commission provider isn't, hasn't been in hired or hasn't been included in the project yet, which unfortunately happens. Uh, but it's, it should be done and completed by the commission provider. They understand the proposal. They understand what they've been hired for. It's their opportunity to kind of to get in and talk about their process and what they need, what from the design engineer, from the contractors, as far as hours on site access, uh, what their what scope is going to be as far as testing, if they have any sort of sampling procedure. It should be done by the commissioning provider. I will definitely emphasize that. Okay, and I have a, I mean, I that... a quick, a quick, quick plug in because I think it's important to note that you know what sticking in, in terms of you know energy required commissioning obviously there's, there's plenty of value to do commissioning on every project but you know there's a lot of stringent codes out there including new york city that if you look at it by the letter of the code energy code uh, where basically anything over twelve thousand square feet if you if you factor out the the 40 tons of connected load because that's what triggers commissioning in new york city a lot of projects are required to have or have commissioning performed but they do not i mean uh, <laughs> it's as blunt as that um and eventually you know the, the uh, authorities will, will will catch up. Let, let me Sorry. just keep the move, keep it moving, guys. At, at the second there, uh, question: As the commissioning authority, how do you track quite, uh, changes that happens during constant architectural owner interactions that should actually be incorporated in the OPR? Question: I have had instances where design reviews go against the OPR, and these changes were then approved later without official updates to the OPR. So I guess is the OPR a living document? Short answer, yes. Uh, the OPR is a, is a living document. Um, Cause again, when is it created? It's before the building is even con conceived really. That's when it should be started. Um, most of these documents are living documents. 
there's almost nothing that the commissioning provider produces as, except for like a final report and, and, and back end material that is kind of like to be seen as a contract document. But everything is a living, should be a living document. Um, it should be updated on, as changes are made. Um, commissioning providers, we, we know that we're not privy to every conversation. Uh, so there, there are times where we have to, you know, claim ignorance to say what was changed, help us understand this, we'll help you document this change along the way. So it's, it is important for the, the commission provider partner up with the owner and the architect and be involved in a lot of those early OAC calls um, to understand this process. Okay, maybe if we move forward, uh, Bennett, just keep it. Yep. Thanks. And no, I'll kind of move to this one quickly because we were already kind of touching on some of these, but how um, can the, this phase be supported? Um, clearly defining expectations, this is all about the OPR, uh, getting them documented, getting them uh, collaborating with them and, and talking about them. Uh, facilitating communication, this is, the, this is the commission plan, identifying roles and responsibilities, uh, general command channels, and understanding the description of the commissioning activities. And then providing timely decisions, this is where we come in with the, the design review. Um, the correct time to do a design review is really kind of during the 50% CD set, that's where there's enough material in there to really bite into uh, and, and make valuable changes. So now I wanna kind of talk about the construction phase. Uh, many of you are aware of the construction phase. This is where I said earlier, we're on site and we're seeing a lot more. Um, there is a gap between the design and construction with most projects with, since MEP is, is installed a bit later, but one carryover task that we, we can highlight is are the submittal reviews. Um, the submittal reviews should be done by the commission provider and the engineer of record, or re really any, wh whoever can conceive that piece of equipment. Um, so the submittal review, similarly to the design review that I mentioned earlier, it's all about where we're coming from. So commissioning provider, have, have an owner on your shoulder, bring the spirit of the OPR through the submittal review, make sure everything aligns uh, is, is vitally important. Um, again, talk about identifying issues early, um, calling out information that conflicts with the OPR uh, and engaging uh, the engineer or record or the GC for clarification and um, collaboration. So are you looking for clearances here? Access to- yeah. So, okay. so short answer, not yet. Um, and it's a that's a great segue into the next task, which is the construction observations. Um, this is where we conduct site visits. This is where we're really first introduced to the the, the on-site team. Uh, and the construction observations, they are sometimes done and sometimes not done. Uh, we always value them. We always value getting on site, making connections with the the integrators, the GCs, everyone who's really involved in the project. And this ties back to our earlier themes of identifying issues early. Um, as stuff is being installed, uh, we make sure that there are adequate clearances, um, everything is installed in the proper orientation, uh, things are installed in, in the right, you know, the, the equipment is being delivered that is the correct equipment. Uh, I had one uh, situation where it was as simple as, I had two rooftop units, and one of them was supposed to be a 10 ton unit and one was supposed to be a 20 ton unit. And from these construction observations, I was able to identify that they were installed in the opposite locations. Um, if you know anything about these units, they're quite heavy. So we were able to identify this before they had to deconstruct the crane. So they had to use the crane to relocate these units before they installed them. Uh, something as simple, and they look very identical. So it's, I understand how it was made, but it's having that extra on-site presence is able to identify these issues. But shouldn't that be picked up in a punch list, Bennett? Like that's where I'm, I've always been confused between punch lists and commissioning agents. Sure. And, and there's definitely overlap. I'm, I'm not going to say that a punch list and like a commission provider doesn't do punch list type activities. Um, but a punch list is being done by either a mechanical engineer an architect or electrical engineer. And what are they looking at? A mechanical engineer is gonna look at mechanical equipment. Electrical engineer is gonna look, they got electrical equipment. No one's really there looking at everything together other, other than possibly an, an, an owner's rep. Um, but the commissioning provider, I, I think what I wanna kind of show is that the, 
and I, I've kind of been mentioning this a couple of times, we're, we're the eyes and ears of the owner. So we're looking at the project as a whole. Um, and, and what I say a lot of times is that I'm in the eyeballs business. So it's my job to get the correct eyeballs on a certain issue. Uh, there are plenty of people that are involved in, in a certain project. It takes a village. So it, it's all about bringing in the correct people once I identify an issue. And so maybe I don't know who, who is the best person is. So that's why we'll call a meeting if we see an open issue and say, hey, let's talk about this. We think this is something worthwhile. Um, so again, it's, it's about where we come from. So it can be by really eyes and ears of the owner. Gotcha. And finally, uh, functional performance testing. Uh, this, I would say, is really the, the heart and soul of commissioning, uh, where we get on site and, and test the equipment. Uh, we we kind of take the lead here, where a lot of times we've been kind of lurking in the shadows and providing comments. This is where we take a more prominent role uh, in, in functional testing. Um, but this is where we kind of walk through the sequence of operations of equipment, uh, and, and we can identify issues in the sequence. We could provide clarity to the contractors. Uh, we kind of bring our mechanical, intellectual, and plumbing expertise uh, where it needs to be. Um, Is this, and then this, where, where are some like things that you've seen go wrong on this functional testing? I mean, I've, I've seen where functioning testing is really creativity and assuming and creating scripts to anticipate things going wrong. So mm -hmm. there's some examples where I think this is really, from my perspective, um, you're, you're playing devil's advocate trying to figure out where things fail. Yeah, and the, you know, <laughs> The list is too long to, to count, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a few examples. Um, and as you mentioned, playing devil's advocate, we're trying to we're trying to break this thing effectively. We're trying to break break this car and and make sure that it has the proper safeties in place to to run it correctly. Uh, one example I actually ran into yesterday down here in Raleigh. Um, it was in this sequence there is a supply temperature reset set up and. The, con the controls contractor didn't fully understand it. They didn't fully understand what set points they wanted us to set, what sensors we wanted to use. Um, so they just didn't do it. So th things like this, we catch and uh, they lead directly to energy savings. Uh, there, there was an example uh, that I believe it was about 100, in, in one space where an air handler serves 100,000 square feet, it'll save about $6,500 in annual savings just by setting up this one sequence. So th these are things that design engineers, uh, they spend a lot of time on. They spend a lot of time thinking about, it. and if it's not done and installed correctly, where did that go? So it is a lot of time and effort wasted that you, that you capture in the commissioning process. It's back to the point about it being an investment. Exactly. So it's it's about that investment. There's another issue that, that we ran into when we were testing uh, a generator uh, out in uh, a project that we have. And what we were seeing is that it had a separate, uh, like a remote radiator uh, separated from the unit itself. But a lot of generators use those radiators for exhaust. So this space didn't have it. Um, it was okay when they first installed it, um, but they had increased the number of generators in that room. Uh, so when that generator was running, we were measuring near the ceiling, uh, the temperature was getting up to 260 degrees. Um, so so we, we called, and we were only running the generator for about two hours. So if that generator is running much longer than that, you have sprinkler heads up there. So this is this is about resiliency and safety. So, so uh, Ben, you're being challenged here a little bit. How do you go ahead, go about calculating energy savings from such change? This is a question from the audience, sorry. Yep. Uh, how do you go about calculating energy savings from such changes, differences, and sequences from the drawing set to the equipment? So a, a lot of the, the numbers that we've been referencing refer to specific reports. Um, and this can be, and we work with our, I mean, we, we'll work with our DCARP team to try to identify some of these issues. Uh, I think the way to measure these is what is the energy savings if you did it before versus without? It's, sometimes it's easier than others. So sometimes if something isn't installed, it's really easy to find in retro commissioning because you, you have energy data. Uh, certainly there are not every issue that you find in commissioning reverts directly to energy. In, in my mind, there are three main kind of things that you find in, in commissioning. One is anything that's energy efficiency related. 
as far as not having a valve run or open when it doesn't need to, and you, you can capture that temperature. Uh, then the other one is for safety and resiliency, like I mentioned with this generator, making sure stuff will fail correctly. And then the other one is, is, is actually a good segue to the warranty phase is, is operational effectiveness in making the system easy to run uh, and easy for the building operator to use. Um, cause at, at the end of the, end of the day, like if they don't know how a building is supposed to be run, they won't run it the right way. Right. Uh, so maybe we go into that. Yeah. Um, real quick, I'll just kind of go over, uh, how, how, uh, the construction phase can be supported. Um, again, with, coll with collaboration, it's important to ensure access and resources to the commission provider. And that's, that's identified early in the design phase. We encourage contractor collaboration and that they are able to support functional testing. Switching into the acceptance and warranty phase, this in my mind is where the most value can be captured on the back end. And oftentimes it's kind of glossed over because at the end of a project, everyone wants to be finished up, everyone wants to be done. It's, it's a long process to get to this point, but to get over that finish line the right way is, is really vital for that, that building's next 20 year, 30 year lifespan is to make sure it's set up for success. Um, uh, starting off with the acceptance warranty phase, the final commission report, every project has this in whatever form it can be. One thing I want to highlight with the final commission report, this should be the first place that a, a building engineer goes to when they have an issue. Uh, let, let's go look at the log. Let, let's, let's see what happened. Let's see what issues were, were on, on site. Let, let's see what we saw. Um, so they can refer to what happened is this something that we found earlier? Is this something that we fixed? What did we change? It's a good good history of the commissioning process and what we saw. Uh, next, I want to highlight training and specifically the systems manual. Uh, this is a really valuable document uh, that gives the building engineer all the tools that they need. So it's it, it ties the system together. It, it, it gives O and M manuals for every piece of equipment. It gives you the sequence operations. Uh, it talks about the, um, anything that's unique to the facility that the building engineer needs, it should be in the system manual. And this is a manual for your car. If, if you have any issues or any questions of where do I go to, you can, you should be able to use this system manual to identify who do I call, what, it, what system is this tied to? Any sequence of oper operations uniqueness is identified in this and it's kind of all encompassing. And finally, the last task I wanna highlight is, is the warranty phase support. So this, this is one year after substantial completion. And it's, in my mind, com the standard commissioning process, it's, it's a time and it's a place in time, sorry, points in time process that will test a building at a specific time, giving an extra year, an extra dimension to it of understanding how the building performs over a long period of time will, able, will enable you to find issues that you maybe thought you fixed or had a Band-Aid put on it and, and it was, was kind of hidden, uh, but it, it should be really seen as, as a good handover process. So like during this phase, some of the activities that are done is, is there's a 10 month warranty visit before all the warranties are up, the commission provider will, will come back out and talk to the building engineer, say, how is it going? Those issues that we found, are they still issues? Are they still corrected? Um, what other difficulties have you had? Like what's been difficult? Do you have any rogue rooms that are preventing you from doing certain sequences? Um, and really give them the support that they need because it's, it's all about enabling people to, to do their, their, their job correctly. Um, and then it, it could be also used to set up uh, monitoring based commissioning, which is a whole kind of industry in itself in understanding that the commissioning process can be an ongoing process uh, kind of throughout. Uh, there, there, is, there are stats behind energy degradation where after about one or two years and the energy of a building will, will increase by about 10 to 30%. And that, that, that's from a Texas A&M study. So that's natural. If, you, if are there are proper preventative maintenance uh, plans in place and you're able to identify issues as they go, um, that, that stat can be reduced and it can really help the, the life cycle of the building. Okay. And finally, uh, kind of supporting this acceptance and warranty phase, uh, I encourage everyone to kind of participate in training. 
the building operator. And even during functional testing, I would recommend that the building operator uh, participate so they can understand what was changed, how it was changed, why it was changed. And they can even provide their own input of, you know, I really prefer that set point be placed here so I can find it easily. Something as simple that is, is, is for your car. When you know, when you hop in a car, you have your steering wheel right in front of you, your gear shifter to your right. It's what you're comfortable with. If it's set up slightly differently and you can hop in that thing and you not know, maybe you're, you know, in England and you're driving on, on the left side of the, or, or yeah, the left side of the road. Uh, it's a little bit new to you. So you can voice your opinion and fix those things then. Um, it's also important to review the commission documentation that you have everything that you need, uh, whether it's a, a systems manual, a preventive maintenance plan, an ongoing commissioning plan, review that, that you have everything that you need and, and bring up what you need. Because as I said earlier, we're in the eyeballs business. We're all about getting people what they need and getting the right people to the table. Uh, and then finally, engaging in the warranty support. Uh, it, it's again, it's it's vital for that last few months to kind of get over the finish line correctly uh, and, and start this turnover process to, to operations and help out the building engineer do what they need to do to kind of reach a lot of these goals and these stats that we talked about earlier. Okay, great. So maybe we can just close on some yeah. key take takeaways again. Thank, thank you, Bennett. Uh, so this this was a quick run rundown of commissioning. And I think, you know, Bennett can speak for a lot longer on each slide, but I hope we now have a better understanding of the actual process. Um, so let's just summarize the key takeaways. We've highlighted how commissioning is an integral process in the project from early design through post occupancy. It's not a single act or point in time. The commissioning service continues even well after everyone has left the contractors, design professionals are complete with their service. Um, commissioning is a, collab a collaboration with the team where all project stakeholders have input and are impacted directly. Uh, we, went over, we went over the benefits to several stakeholders in the presentation and there are more, but we left out in the interest of time. Um, but there's also benefits to the contractors, to the engineers of record, et cetera. The commissioning team facilitates this communication amongst the entire team. And commissioning is an investment. And like with all investments, you wanna see a return. And with immediate benefits like energy savings, Im improving maintenance and operations, I mentioned increase in productivity due to IAQ, just to name a few, the payback is very impressive. Um, and I think it's an investment that everyone would be interested in. Um, so I, wa I wanna kind of close this out by going back to that car, car illustration. Um, and it's quite simple. You engage a commissioning agent, a third party commissioning agent early on, they will ensure that your project is fully aligned from the start to the finish with the owner's requirements. Um, that's That started this whole project to begin with, and we hope we were able to portray that in this presentation. Right. Um, can open it up, I guess. Uh, yeah, Victoria, uh, so for everybody's sake, we'll, we'll open it up. If there's any questions, you can, the, the mics will be open. Um, and if I could kindly ask if you can take that little QR code mm -hmm. and if you can, people answer or, there's a survey, if you could kindly answer the survey, it just helps us. We do these webinars on different subjects quite often, and this would help us do better ones each time. So if there's any questions to the audience, uh, the attendees, please feel free to ask. But I, I, I just wanna go back to those slides with the numbers, Bennett, um, with the numbers that you had that were pretty impressive. You, uh, one key thing I, I heard, but it, it didn't make the slide. Um, what was the retro commissioning payback? That was pretty impressive. Yeah, so I have it on the screen right now. I, I went back to that slide. Uh, retro commissioning. It's, oh, it's there about, it is. Yeah, it's about 1.1 years. Um, and to give it, I think, a little bit more understanding for this is that I think when you're retro commissioning a project, oftentimes it's because it's a project that is, is kind of showing signs of of, of, of energy degradation, as I mentioned earlier. Um, also, it's it's not as much of a long drawn out process. We know what we're going for. We can target what specifically what what we need to do, and we can get in there effectively. And I think right. uh, Bennett, just to add to that, you know, this even if the project, a new new system, a new new building is commissioned, uh, things start to fail almost right away. Uh, within a few months, you you have you know valves or sensors or whatnot and equipment is starting to fail. So, 
there's deterioration equipment, there's uh, energy efficiency drift, there's, you know, that, that starts. So within a couple of years, it's estimated that the building loses about 15 to 20% in efficiency uh, and energy efficiency, just because, you know, could also be due to, you know, uh, um, as they call a human error, um, where, you know, things are left open because, you know, things started to fail. So that is why the payback is so much greater as well on the retro commissioning. It's a very attractive return. And then in relation to the, there was a good question about, I, I love the way people, th like these are all numbers that people throw up, uh, throw out there. I'm going to say throw up, throw out there. And um, one of the things that I think you made a key point, um, uh, Bennett, is when you're retro commissioning, you have a before and after. There's no, you know, definitive. When you're calculating and, you know, going back and you said 6,500 in savings, you probably calculated that with the decarb team, um, but that's it's always a calculation. Cal real life and calculations always are always a little different. Uh, there's some questions here. Let me get. Uh, I do, uh, there's a question here. Um, I don't believe the benefits of commissioning are known, and the process ends up being a might as well activity. Um, after commissioning, how do you personally make sure that the team is aware of the benefits that your activities resulted in? What metrics, apart from just the number of issues, would you discuss in such a conversation? So, pitch a story why commissioning. Like you, how would how how does the team know that commissioning benefit? This is a great question because you guys are kind of in the background a lot of times, a lot of time in the field. But um, what 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 are some stories that you know pitch the benefits? of commissioning? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a good question. And, you know, that, that even kind of ties back to why we're having a, a, a webinar like this um, to, because it's all about in my, in my mind, getting commissioning out, out of the view as it being a code requirement. Um, and, and cause it's, if it's required by code, it'll be done, but it won't be valued as much. Um, so if people can see the value, they'll do it regardless of code. Um, and honestly, you'll, you'll stay ahead of code and kind of out of that. If it's done as a necessity, um, it, it's kind of, it's not as, you know, it, it's not seen in the same light. Um, right. but as, as far as going through some examples beyond energy savings, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to some of those three key points that I pointed out earlier of, of energy savings and then resiliency and, and safety for specifically large le electrical equipment. Right. Um, you don't see energy savings when everything's working well, but you will see uh, costs go up in capital expenditures if a generator fails or a there's downtime in a data center. That'll right. that'll rack up pretty quickly um, exactly. as far as the cost. Um, and then the other one is is again it's hard to see, but it's operational effect of uh, efficiency. It's giving the building engineers the opportunity to run their building well, so they can focus on other stuff. Um, we have a question in the uh, audience, uh, Blair. I'm going to unmute you. Um, there's a question, one of those little hands um, sticking up. Yeah, Blair, if you yeah, can, please, please. Thank you. Hurry. Um, yeah, it saves me from having to type all this. So, automated fault detection diagnostics is a code requirement for packaged equipment, um, and I'm trying to figure out how we integrate or how we're using AFDD when it's built into the actual equipment as opposed to being more holistically applied to a project. Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, so it's F, FDD is is definitely newer compared to a lot. A lot and, and FDD is fault detection and diagnostics. So it, it's kind of involved in that monitoring based commissioning portion. And, and honestly, monitoring based commission could be a, a webinar on itself uh, to really kind of in, incorporate a, a controls team to understand it. Uh, with packaged equipment, it's all about collaboration and getting that manufacturer's rep involved. Because um, because whether it's even the sequence or FDD that's built into the unit, um, it'll spit out and give information to itself. Uh, but if it's not brought out of the of the equipment and brought to either the BMS or a software uh, like SkySpark, uh, or something that can be used to make imp and implement changes, it won't, won't be very valuable. So it's because I get it, it's relatively new, so it's it's more or less on, on a we'll see basis. But it's it's all about collaboration and getting that information out of it and talking to the manufacturer, get the manufacturer involved. So this kind of ties back to how 
finishing needs to be a collaborative process and get everyone involved as early as you can. But it's a very important thing to, to highlight and, and identify early. And that's probably something that uh, no knock on anyone like um, a requirement like that on a project from an OPR that's that could be easily overlooked, right? And that's the lens that the commissioning team comes with. It's they're focusing on you know operation and meeting those requirements, and you know that's something we would pick up early on, and we'll address it. You know, it'll be addressed via the factory, via controls, as opposed to trying to deal with it after the fact. Is that helpful? I had a, a follow up to that. Um... With regard to monitor-based commissioning, is there a uh, project profile that would be the tipping point between using uh, MBCX program like SkySpark or something like that, as opposed to just getting trend logs and doing trend analysis through BMS reporting? Hmm. So if I understand your question correctly, you're saying is it valuable to use something like SkySpark on like a small, small fit out in like an equipment room somewhere distant on, on a campus versus we have a prominent building that that's um, has a lot of equipment, uh, large chiller plants that are, that are tied to it. it uh, clearly it's valuable there. Um, as far as it being a tipping point, I think that all depends on, I think the cost to integrate and, and the cost to create that. Um, it's, it, there is a balance. I, I do. I know what you mean. I, like, I don't know exactly what that tipping point would be, um, but I think some of the decisions that you would want to make would be how much does it take to integrate it, and how much, you know, energy savings do you expect, or energy degradation do you expect in a system like that? If you have a, a small building that is only, you know, the energy consumption from it is only, let's say, ten thousand dollars a year, uh, relative to some of the buildings out there that could be, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a month. Uh, systems like that will be more vital to, to cap capture. Um, so I think those would be some decisions into, into making that. As far as where that cutoff line is, you know, I think that kind of depends on on the building and, and the software that you're integrating. Well, is that good with that? Thank you. Okay. Um, any, so we're, we're, we're almost done with time. Anybody have any other questions? I think otherwise I think we'll wrap it up. And uh, I thank everybody for coming. Um, really appreciate your time. Hope this was helpful. And please, if you could kindly fill out that questionnaire and any other topics, maybe this commissioning, uh, continuous commissioning might be another topic, Bennett, that you can get focused on or we can get do a deep dive on the on the IECC 2021, uh, mm. that would be that would be great. Or, or retro commissioning that that's that's, that's right. a big one. You know, nowadays with all the uh, energy energy compliance codes, uh, retro commissioning saves like immediate, is immediate savings. So I think that's a really big one nowadays. Okay, I would like to see what you guys uh, are coming across that is in the code that's codified that nobody is providing and all these building officials just are, are totally overlooking because, you know, to the, to the point of commissioning, yes, yeah, so owners, owners are going to get burned. They're not going to be able to close out permits. Uh, contractors are going to be left holding the bag. Owners are going to have to pay well yeah. beyond. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's happened. We, we, you know, clients have reached out to us after the fact saying, I'm trying to close out the project, but they're asking me for a commissioning report. <laughs> you know, after you know they've been uh, occupied for for a couple of months, right? But a couple of, a couple of clients reach out to us, and um, mm -hmm. obviously it's it's too late. I mean, but we 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 went and we did our commissioning. We did what we had to do. We picked up uh, issues and we, we wrote a report. But that does come up a lot, Blair. You'll be you'll be surprised. I mean, as of now, a lot of the jurisdictions, like I said, New York City, it's it's anything over forty tons connected. It used to be any forty tons of new system, but now it's. So if you're connecting into a 50 ton ACE unit that's existing, you got to perform commissioning. And if you factor, if you kind of do the back of envelope calculation, that equates to about a 12,000 square foot space. But it's it all comes down to the engineer record. They check a box, commissioning required or not. And if they click not required, it kind of goes under the radar until an audit happens. Or but they are they're going to get more strict. There's now some jurisdictions that require commissioning on every job. And it varies from from you know town to town, but they get yeah, more strict. 
And Blair, if I could jump in, um, and we'll, we'll send send you kind of a list of some of the deliverables and tasks that that are oftentimes overlooked, but included in a lot of these, and and, and many of them that we mentioned today are, are in there. Specifically, like the the um, the ten month warranty visit, supremely vital in my mind, but a lot a lot of times it just doesn't get done. And as I mentioned, the OPR is only done about sixty to seventy percent of the time. Uh, and that's that is actually in one of the uh, articles that we've looked up and we'll, we'll include links to a lot of those articles that we referenced so you can have some some light reading over the over the weekend if you would. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely is important for us to identify those and it's important for us to communicate. And that's one of the points of these uh, presentations to help um, our end users understand the commissioning process and everything that should go into it. Um, a lot of times when we compete with other firms out there. They may not. They may say that they're going to do it and have no intention of doing it, and then they'll they'll say we'll do it for half the price, <laughs> but they have no intention of doing a lot of these things that are really going to give you guys the value and, and like you said, like prevent you from sitting there holding the bag and having this building that doesn't work as it should. Good point, Bennett. Thanks. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, people asking questions because it really helps um, when you do these webinars. It, makes it more interactive, brings it more relative to what's happening out in the current industry. So thank you for asking questions. So we're just keeping on time here, guys. So I think we're good. Any more questions? Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you, everyone joining us and uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.